Uh, well, first, just to explain a bit the process where when we organize the the winter school and the summer school, we do a program with BART, which is pretty much the program you you have in your folders. And then we send nice emails to the speakers to say, oh, would you like to come to talk about this topic? And that's pretty much it. This is the only information they have. So sometimes they say yes, but then they've kind of afterthoughts. And they say, what's actually the topic you want me to talk about? Because <laughs> we don't give really a lot of information. Uh, of course, we do that also because we want to give freedom and because we know that people have been working um, in this field. So for instance, in the case of Jan Doh, I was thinking about uh, all the work that Brecht uh, has done. So maybe it's important to re-explain that um, Jan Doh uh, works in uh, the KU Leuven. So it's a university hospital and it's a very, uh, I mean, quite a unique setup because you have, uh, I don't know, a park of PhD students, I would say, <laughs> in a very big room. <laughs> You have a lot of uh, permanent staff uh, in small offices around them. And this big room is just in the heart of the hospital. And so when uh, Jan gets you visiting the, his lab, he moves very quickly through what's uh, truly a labyrinth, because you know any hospital. I have no sense for direction, so I, I always get lost in hospitals. And he pushes the door and he says, yeah, this is the animal setup. Then he goes there and yeah, this is the echo room. And of course, it's this, this great vision of uh, being inside the hospital and having access to patients. Uh, so you have clinicians who come to, I've seen when you're in this room, they, they just get out of the operating room, they still wear all the, <laughs> all the sterile uh, clothes and they are checking a case with someone saying, oh, I did a very nice case this morning, you should check it, it's there, I put it there. So it's this, this type of philosophy about having a lab really immersed in a, in a hospital, and I think Leuven is really uh, one of the best examples of that in Europe. So that being said, the topic I asked Ian to present is about uh, animal um, experiments in the context of validating image processing algorithm. So it's indeed not an easy topic, and you know, <laughs> you're a bit worried about uh, what you should say uh, exactly about this topic, but I'm sure you'll do a great job because we know all the work you have done, all the students, and uh, particularly all this setup uh, being integrated really with the hospital and with the animal experiments, and getting really engineers meeting uh, physicians and physiologists. So we look very much forward to your talk, and thanks a lot for coming and traveling at a very busy time, because Jan was in a presentation, a thesis presentation yesterday. So he arrived very late in Lyon, and. Uh, we are very grateful that he could make it. Uh, so again, the original title was this one, uh, but then if I wanted to do that in a scientifically accurate way, I felt this was extremely broad. Uh, and so I took the liberty to narrow this down a bit. And so, first of all, I will not start to explain or go through literature uh, in terms of everything done in validating image processing algorithms, but I'll try to limit myself to myself to the ones that some were uh, somehow involved uh, echocardiography, which is my main uh, specialty. And then also uh, I felt that if I was just going to show study after study that used animal models and what they found, I thought that would maybe be a bit boring and you could as well read the papers by yourselves. So I thought uh, to actually put this part data from in between uh, brackets and to really focus on animal models uh, and the animal model setup to validate echocardiographic image processing techniques. I will show some data, but uh, I thought it could actually be interesting in itself to discuss more the animal models and the animal uh, model setup, experimental setup in the context of validation. Um, well, nowadays we are supposed to disclose things in order to show that we are hopefully objectively presenting. So I do have agreement with uh, Vingmet. I have been consultant in the past year for two companies. And we do have uh, some software license to one company. But again, to start off, I uh, would like to emphasize that what I will be showing is maybe not uh, all exact science. It's not a complete overview of everything out there in literature. I know uh, Mathieu was going to tape this and we'll put this on YouTube. So People might feel offended if I did not refer to their study or their work. Uh, 
So please be not be offended. It's not the idea to give this complete uh, overview. I would rather try to give this lecture as my personal experience of working with animal models and uh, uh, that uh, absolutely implies that it can be subjective. So uh, first thing is uh, validation and I know the, the whole uh, winter school has been focusing on this uh, so far. Uh, but when we talk about validation, I think everyone of us has uh, in his mind what that uh, means. Um, everyone would think of testing a software product against some benchmark and see whether it does what we hope it does. Now actually, already the name itself is maybe confusing because if we go to the regulatory offices and we go to FDA uh, as one of the main regulatory offices, we see that they make uh, the difference between verification and validation. Uh, where validation, they say, well, and you can read that there, is the assurance that the product meets uh, the needs of a customer. While the verification is the evaluation whether or not the product uh, complies with requirements and specifications. So actually, I think what most of us within the academic environment or engineering environment consider validation of a product, the regulatory <laughs> offices would refer to as verification. So it's testing whether the product works. If we go to the step of validation in their mind, it really means that we show that whatever software we developed is of value, preferably added value, to the customer, the clinician. So in that sense, the verification is really a technical testing uh, in order to check that uh, the software does what we hope it does in terms of accuracy and precision typically. So it's uh, typically involving technical tests. While the validation is really something uh, or a study or uh, uh, investigation trying to show the clinical value of a medical device. And so it typically involves uh, patients and clinical tests. Uh, validation cannot be done without involving patients. So in fact, if we want to be correct in the context of what the regulatory offices want, then actually the title should have read uh, animal models to verify echocardiographic uh, image processing. Now it's just a name of course, but uh, I have, uh, or uh, it's just nomenclature, uh, but I have experienced in the past that uh, sometimes that leads to misunderstandings. Why are we interested? Maybe that has come up. Uh, well, first of all, as academics and scientists, we like to kind of prove that what we developed is uh, worthwhile and it actually does what we uh, claim it does in terms of uh, how feasible it is, accurate and uh, how precise. Um, and maybe we are also interested in uh, really demonstrating in terms of validation the diagnostic and discriminative power of our technology. Um, from a companies and marketing perspective, well, the verification validation process is maybe also the same, that they like to show that what they sell their customers is uh, useful. But another very important reason to engage in it for them is that it's obliged. So they have to, otherwise they can simply not enter market. So verification validation process in, is intrinsic if we want to bring something uh, to the market. And uh, as some of you may know, actually the EU is constantly changing regulations. And so they changed regulations uh, a few years ago, which will be imposed as from May 2018, so in three months from now, uh, which actually has a big impact on medical uh, ultrasound or medical imaging as gen uh, in general because medical uh, diagnostic tools will be considered a full medical device. And so in terms of regulations, also the diagnostic tools will have to follow the same validation verification processes as any medical device has to. So it will become more strict on what we can bring to the market. And therefore, the, this whole process becomes uh, more elaborate and uh, more important. Uh, and particularly in the new regulations, the post-market, as they call it, uh, follow-up is going to be uh, more critical. So once the product has entered the market, to make sure that it keeps on performing the way you claim it does, uh, becomes more important in these regulations. Okay, um, 
the validation process, I think uh, most of you will know. If you uh, do not agree at some point or you think uh, you want to comment on what I say, please feel free to do so. Eh? You don't have to wait until the very end. Um, so the validation process, well, uh, very well known. So we try to, that's the official definition, uh, it's quite generic, so a procedure to ensure that varied inputs lead to consistent and high quality outputs. So we put something in and then we have our software algorithm and something comes out and we try to make sure that whatever comes out is uh, real and is uh, valuable. So specifically in ECHO we have an image, we have some algorithm that does something to the image, uh, particularly we are interested in quantifying stuff so we want to have a certain measurement and then of course the whole thing is, is this measurement really correct given this image? And we cannot answer that question unless we have some ground truth or we have some reference methodology. And that's of course uh, where animal models and animal uh, validation in an animal setting can help out. Uh, now before I continue, maybe I'll ask, uh, I think most of the people are uh, in a PhD track or a PhD program. Uh, who of you is considering or thinks that during the duration of the project there will be some animal work involved? Or maybe has already worked with animals in the past? Anyone? <laughs> ah, nobody. No. Ah, maybe uh, someone. Nicola? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because I, I wanted to ask the question again at the end and see whether there was a change. Uh, so let's see. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, okay. So if we want to validate in echocardiography and we say software tools, uh, then I think we can try to see what are the typical tools that we try to develop. Uh, because that will give an uh, indication on what kind of validation or reference technologies we uh, can use. Um, well, as you know, typically in echo, these are not the nicest images, but uh, you have seen plenty of them before, I'm sure. Uh, we try to get access to uh, uh, our hands on the morphology of the heart. Uh, so we can do that with caliper measurements uh, and ideally we go to more volumetric measurements. Uh, so LV volume, LV mass, other cardiac chambers, they are uh, important measurements. In terms of systolic function, if we look at the standard parameters, well, quite often they are either derived from these di one-dimensional measurements, so we look at the uh, dimensional changes over the cycle, or we look at volume changes. So in essence, it means that all of these uh, functionalities can be given to the user if we have proper segmentation. So I think that's one important uh, part of tools that we try to give to the clinicians. It's tools that help the segmentation process of one of the cardiac chambers or one of the cardiac structures. Secondly, uh, as you know, well, we have all kinds of uh, tools uh, that help us in assessing myocardial motion or deformation. And we have tools that could try to give access to uh, flow motion or a blood flow motion, so flow pro profiles. And so, Essentially, it means that we try to come up with software tools that can do proper tissue tracking. So I think these are the two big categories. Either we try to segment or we try to track. So if we have these tools and we have software tools to do so, then which uh, possibilities do we have to validate that they actually work and do what we hope they do? Well, and I know you have been uh, going elaborately through synthetic uh, setups on uh, Monday. Yesterday there was discussion about uh, the use of mock models. Today we'll try to focus on the experimental animals. And then, of course, uh, I'm not sure if it's elaborately dealt with tomorrow, but we can think of doing validation setups in patient studies as well, so really in vivo in the clinic. And which one should we choose? Well. Well, I highlighted this green, not because that's the answer to my question. Uh, it's because uh, we are going to focus on that one in particular now. So let's first look at the uh, motion deformation techniques. So the, like the second category of tools that we could try to develop, the tracking tools that lead us to motion deformation of the, of the muscle if we want. And let's see if we want to go through validation in an experimental animal setup what kind of reference methodologies that we have uh, at our uh, 
um, uh, that are available. So I try to list this here. Um, again, excuse me if uh, maybe there is one technique missing, but I do think that these are the more important ones or the, the most commonly used ones, uh, where we have option between invasive methods and non-invasive methods. And so I'll very quickly go through all of these to then kind of compare them and try to conclude from that analysis what seems to be the best way forward if we want to do validation of motion and deformation uh, imaging. Beats are, uh, are, have been used a lot in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, so where basically we take small lead balls, uh, one millimeter, two millimeter diameter, and we push them during surgery into the cardiac muscle so that they get embedded into the tissue and they move along with the tissue obviously as the heart beats. And then as these are lead balls, uh, they actually have very high attenuation for x-ray. So if we do radiography, uh, they show up as uh, radio opaque markers. And so if we implant the whole series, like in this example here that I took from a book from uh, Hunter and McCulloch, uh, yeah, if we take a whole series of such beats, uh, this is a static image, but you can imagine during the heartbeat, then these things move, and you can use post-processing in order to do inter-beat uh, distances, and then from those distances, obviously, you can get, uh, if you have some kind of reference beat anywhere in the image, you can get the motion out, or you can get, due to the, the, the relative displacements, the, the different strain components out. That's one way that was used a lot, as I said, in the 70s and the 80s. Just Alter out of curiosity, how is the, how are these balls attached to the tissue? So you really push them in. You push. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they are uh, kind of embedded. So it's a bit, uh, and actually now that you say that, it's not on my uh, like uh, overview slide, but it's kind of invasive that you also disrupt uh, the, the muscle itself locally. Um, Second option is to go to uh, strain gauges. I think uh, most of you will have encountered those at some point during your uh, training. So essentially, as these things are stretched, they s change their uh, resistance. And so based then on that simple uh, electrical measurement, if you do proper calibration, you can exactly know uh, if there is a certain uh, voltage change, uh, how that corresponds to uh, lengthening of the muscle. So if you attach such a strain gauge to the muscle, it can help you figure out what the local deformations are uh, by a, a quite a simple approach. The disadvantage here is that they obviously, based on the way they work, they only give information on strain, uh, but not on motion as such. Third option is uh, microcrystals, or what is called uh, sonomicrometry. So where we have a small ultrasound crystals that can also be attached to the heart, uh, either as a pair or as a single crystal. Uh, as a pair, we will do a simple uh, time of flight measurement using ultrasound. So we have one element that is transmitting, the other one is listening, and based on the time of flight and the given speed of sound, we know what the instantaneous distance between these two sensors is. And so if these two sensors, just as the beats, are attached to the heart and they move along with the muscle, we can instantaneously calculate distances. We know how these uh, move apart. And if we put one of these elements uh, somewhere in a fixed reference frame, we can also get the uh, motion of the elements and, and the underlying tissue. Um, the setup also works with a single element. It's maybe less commonly used, but uh, it has been used as well. Uh, so where you kind of do a pulse echo measurement uh, and then based on the pulse echo you can per layer try to calculate the, the velocities just using Doppler techniques and then uh, based on the velocity gradients you can obtain the strain. Uh, obviously that only works for uh, the wall thickening so you need really tissue uh, that uh, thickens or thins in between uh, and you have to be able to look in the direction of the thickening or the motion gradient. Okay, those are the three invasive techniques. Um, I'm not going to elaborate much on this. I think most of you will uh, be familiar with this technique, uh, but especially in the 80s, this was considered cold standard if you wanted to look at motion and deformation. Uh, we had to go to MR tagging. Uh, 
And so you do pre-saturation in uh, one certain directions in, in certain imaging or uh, uh, saturation planes. And then you image orthogonal to them, so then these saturation or saturated regions will show up as dark uh, regions in the image, as uh, shown here. And then if you follow those uh, tags during the cycle, you get the motion. And similar to the beats or whatever, if you then do the intertag distances as a function of the cardiac cycle, you also get the strains out. Um, yeah, originally this was like line tagging or uh, the radial tagging, I think uh, kind of, uh, well, lost popularity, although I, I think it was a very good way of doing it. But nowadays, because it's faster in terms of acquisition, um, the spam is used where we really put the grid. Um, so if we now look at all of the methods we have available in our animal model for validation and so for uh, getting a reference out, we can try to look at the pros and cons in order to decide what should we use. So beats, uh, well, the, one of the advantages is that it's uh, quite accurate. In X-ray, we have very good uh, resolution. And well, given the, the radio opaque marker, we also have good contrast. So we can do quite accurate measurements here. We get both motion and strain out. But the, well, uh, Flip side is that it's very labor intensive, implanting each of these beads during surgery. Uh, well, it makes use of ionizing radiation. Maybe these are uh, terminal experiments. So for the animal, it's not a disaster then. But of course, you also the operators have to be in this uh, uh, environment. And then it requires quite a bit of uh, post-processing. So you cannot get motions or strains out on the fly. You will only afterwards see what you actually obtained. And then finally, as actually uh, Mathieu said, um, this is also potentially damaging the tissue itself, so we might be influencing the physiology by implanting the beads. Uh, the gorges, well, they are also very accurate, so that's uh, definitely a pro. Uh, the, the contrasts are that it, well, only gives a strain, we don't have motion as a reference. And essentially, it becomes not possible to get the radial strain. If we want to get the wall thickening out, uh, it doesn't work this way. So we can only get L and C and maybe some uh, shear strains. Sonomicrometry, again, is very accurate. Uh, we get motion and displacements, at least in real time. Uh, the the contrasts are still labor intensive. Um, and if we want to go to strain, we need to do post-processing. And then finally, well, we have MR techniques. I only refer to tagging. There is some more modern uh, approaches with dens and sends and maybe some other uh, sequences that can give us access to strain or motion. Uh, phase contrast, obviously, I didn't list that here. Uh, that have the advantage that they are non-invasive. They give motion and strain. But the flip side is that they, well, they require post-processing and that they are less accurate. They have intrinsic measurement uh, errors. The, uh, so they are less accurate than the invasive methods. So if we have to make a choice and we say we need a reference for validating motion strain in an animal setting, it seems logic to go to the most accurate reference you could get. And if we then look at this table and we try to do that in an unbiased way, we would say, well, we have to go invasive. Uh, we have to insert one of these uh, instruments that give us an external reference of what we're supposed to measure. Uh, and obviously, as this is very invasive and destructive to the muscle in a way, you cannot do that in humans, so you kind of are obliged to go to animals. So if we go back to this uh, slide where I had these different circles indicating the different uh, uh, approaches to validation, then we could say, well, the experiment, experiment, experimental animals, they fit somewhere here. So where we have on the y-axis, how reliable the reference method is, and on the x-axis, how realistic the data set is, terms, uh, both in terms of the imaging conditions and in terms of the physiology or pathophysiology. So obviously, synthetic data would sit uh, at the top left corner here. The, we know exactly what we're supposed to measure, so the ground truth is not questionable. Although there, maybe there is some uh, uncertainty as well, but uh, we could say this is uh, extremely certain what we're supposed to measure. But maybe the realism of the data set is not uh, as good as we would like. At the other end of the spectrum, we really have patient studies. 
uh, where of course the level of realism is as it's supposed to be. Uh, but our reference is uh, relatively poor. And so the experimental, experimental animals and the mock models, they fall in between. So in essence, because uh, in these experimental animals, we still have access to fairly reliable reference methods, but we do compromise the realism of the data set somewhat. We could say that all levels of validation uh, ben have benefits and require this attention, require to be spent some time on. So why uh, would we use uh, animal models? Uh, so as I just said, uh, and again this is in the context of validating motion strain algorithms. Um, we get a good level of reliability of the reference measurements. We have a fair level of realism of the imaging data. That's what I just said in the previous slide. But in addition, and that was not on the previous slide, I think it enables us to modulate the pathophysiology and check that the response we obtain is as expected. So we can get more like a dynamic scenario and we don't have like a, a instantaneous observation, one-to-one -one correspondence, but actually we can create a range of uh, measurement conditions under controlled, in a, in a controlled manner. And this is actually important and I'll come back to that later. Now, if we are convinced that uh, to validate our algorithm that we have to go to the animal scenario, then we have to make a choice. There is multiple animals available, many more than what I show on the slide. The animals I show here are the ones that are very commonly used in cardiovascular research, going from rodents to rabbit, dog, pig, sheep, and I guess sheep is typically the largest animal used in uh, cardiovascular research. Sometimes horses or calves, but that's much less common. Now, if we think of clinical systems and clinical software, uh, so software to be used in a clinical environment, then it kind of excludes all of the small animals. Because if we want to, want, uh, if we want to go to small animals, as you know, we need uh, higher time space resolution of our imaging device. And so we need to adapt the imaging device as such, which can have impact on uh, our software and on the outcome. So testing clinical software uh, in an uh, Again, this is for ultrasound, eh? so it might be different for other modalities, but uh, testing clinical software in these small animals doesn't seem to make sense. So that leaves us to the bigger animals, um, where I made that cross orange because people still do this, dogs. We have done that in the past as well, uh, but it becomes ethically more and more difficult to work with dogs. Um, you could... Uh, have a discussion on whether that makes sense or not. Like uh, many people I talk to that work in the animal lab on a daily basis and that worked intensively both with dogs and with pigs, they feel that the, the pig is a more intelligent uh, animal than the dog. So in terms of intelligence, that wouldn't make sense to exclude dogs and not pigs. But of course, the dog is much more pettable. Uh, it doesn't smell as a pig does. Uh, so that seems to make it easier to work with a pig than with a dog. But uh, whether it's ethical or not, uh, you could discuss. Uh, it seems that dogs are nowadays more difficult. And so you also see them being used less and less in cardiovascular research. So essentially, we're left with uh, two options. We can go for a sheep or for a pig. And um, which one to pick uh, or to choose? <laughs> um, well, actually, uh, if you look in literature, it depends a lot on history and sometimes there is pathophysiological backgrounds to go for one animal or the other but to my feeling a lot depends on what people are used to work with within their research domain and so we see in electrophysiology particularly they have been and in some uh, like fall surgery they have been using sheep a lot um, if you go to ischemic heart disease uh, there has been much more work in uh, pigs um, Again, I'm not a specialist in the pathophysiology of these animals and how closely it is related to the pathophysiology of uh, uh, humans. But uh, to my feeling, it's mostly based on history. Now, something that is uh, important when choosing uh, which animal to work with 
uh, is to realize that if we want to go in and, as we said, for motion strain validation, we have to implant devices. So it means we have to open up the thorax, we have to uh, do a sternotomy or a thoracotomy. That the sternotomy is much easier in a pig. Uh, basically, the, the sternum in a pig is more uh, cartilage-like, and if you take a scalpel, you can like cut it open. Uh, if you go to the sternum of a sheep, it's really a thick bone that is uh, quite heavily vascularized. So you literally have to take a surgical saw and uh, cut the bone. And then you have to be careful for bleeding because there is quite a lot of muscles. So essentially the sternotomy by trained uh, surgeon or physician in a pig can be done in, I don't know, half an hour, 15 minutes if uh, they're fast. Uh, in a sheep, it can take uh, two hours or something, an hour and a half in itself, just to open up the chest and, well, keep the animal alive, obviously. Um, so that could be a choice. Uh, the peak, in a way, is more practical if you want to go for sternotomy. Um, alternatively, rather than trying to open up via the sternum, you can also open up by uh, going in between the ribs, so doing a thoracotomy. And that's definitely also an option in the sheep. So, yeah. Um, another thing we have experienced, and actually uh, we experienced it the hard way uh, by just having many animals uh, die in our hands, uh, is that pigs turn out to be much more uh, arrhythmogenic uh, upon manipulation. So if you start touching the heart during surgery and you manipulate it, then uh, they seem to be much more sensitive to it and sometimes all of a sudden the ventricle fibrillates and you can try to shock it in order to cardiovert and get sinus rhythm again but uh, quite often that didn't work. And so sheep in that sense seem to be uh, more practical because they seem to be less sensitive to these manipulations. Finally, the pig, uh, as you know, they grow quite big quite quickly um, and actually they're bred to grow uh, big quickly. Um, so that means that typically in order to make it practical to work with them, we want to have a pig of about uh, 35, 40 kilograms, uh, otherwise it becomes cumbersome, there is a lot of fat and uh, it makes all, everything more difficult, also the imaging aspect. Um, so it basically means if you want to have a reasonable sized animals, that if you look at the lifetime of these animals that we're actually looking at adolescents. So they are not fully grown adult uh, beings. So that's also a kind of a disadvantage for the pig. So there is pros and cons, and uh, you can choose the one that seems to be best fit. Now typically, uh, the now this is the work of Brecht that uh, Mathieu was referring to, that we did uh, several years ago. And actually the protocol was based on uh, the protocol that we did uh, in 2004. Uh, with Stian Langeland. Um, so in that study, we have chosen to work with uh, sheep. And so typically, uh, of course, you need somehow to induce uh, anesthesia, so the, the animal has to be asleep. Uh, then once it's asleep, like in any surgery, you have to make sure that uh, the animal gets intubated and properly ventilated. Uh, then yeah, you have to maintain the anesthesia and also analgesia so that uh, the animal doesn't uh, feel pain. Um, and then <clears throat> typically you also want to instrument the animal to get some physiological signals out, both in terms of your research uh, questions, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second, uh, but also to make sure that the animal is stable so that if you see that uh, the animal becomes uh, hemodynamically unstable that you can intervene in time before the animal uh, dies. So of course uh, all of this uh, is done by surgeons or physicians. Uh, it's not a good idea as an engineer to get engaged in this uh, and you better leave it to the collaborators. Uh, so what we have typically measured is uh, well the, the left ventricular pressures using a micromanometer that you can insert via the carotid and then you go back through the aorta into the left heart. Uh, central venous pressure is typically relevant that you also get uh, via neck uh, vein. Um, and then yeah, you need to be able to administer drugs uh, or uh, agents, uh, which is typically done through an uh, arterial sheet. Um, not unimportantly, 
Uh, in our experiments, actually, we started off with the sternotomy, and as I said, in sheep, that's quite challenging, so it took always a lot of preparation time just to get access to the heart in a, in a, in a stable animal. Uh, but then later on, we started to work with the thoracotomy. It kind of uh, gives a little bit less space to maneuver around during surgery and imaging, uh, but it turned out to work also quite well. So if you would go into sheep, uh, I would recommend you to choose for the thoracotomy, unless your uh, protocol would uh, have a contraindication for that. Uh, of course, the whole idea is to also keep the physiology close, or pathophysiology, close to what we have in humans, uh, in terms of motion and deformation of the heart. And it is well known that uh, if you remove the pericardial uh, sac, so the, the membrane that sits around the, the heart, um, that if you remove that uh, membrane, that the motion and deformation is markedly changed. Um, people know that also, uh, maybe you have seen such studies in heart transplant patients, there intrinsically you, they have to remove the pericardium uh, to put the new, the new heart in. And if you look at these hearts in an echo image, they make very funny motion. So they move in a different way. So if we want to keep our model uh, somewhat physiological in terms of motion and deformations, uh, we would have to keep the pericardium there, but then we need to go in to touch, uh, attach uh, devices to the muscle. So that kind of doesn't allow that. So what we have as a compromise is that you kind of uh, open up the membrane you open it up, but you don't uh, destroy it completely, so that you can create something as what they call in literature a, a pericardial cradle, so that it's opened up at the top, but the rest of the pericardium is still in place, uh, so that the, the motion and the deformations are restricted somewhat, but you do have access surgically to the, to the heart muscle. Okay. Um, now, Next step is that we need our reference measurement. Eh? That's why we started the surgery in the first place. So in our experiments, we have chosen to work with uh, sonomicrometry, mostly because uh, the people involved, Patrick Wouters, that was supposed to lecture just uh, before me, uh, he had been working with that technique uh, during his PhD training. So we just uh, built upon his expertise and stick, uh, stuck to uh, sonomicrometry. So where on the outside of the heart, we can suture uh, with a small wire uh, these uh, small ultrasound sensors onto the muscle. Uh, visually, we try to align the crystal pair with the longitudinal axis of the heart so that we can get longitudinal motion or deformation out. Uh, we also try to align one pair along the circumferential direction. And then, if we also want to get the reference measurement for the radial strain, we have to put an element or a sensor on the endocardial side, uh, op opposite of one on, of these elements. And how do we do that? Well, actually, in the same way as the beads are put, so there, there is a special needle that allows you to puncture through the heart wall, and that then uh, enables to deliver a crystal on the inner side. Um, no, 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 no. It's a beating, yeah. But then it's a nightmare to do it, no? To try yeah, to so align. Yeah, yeah, so it takes uh, skills, absolutely, and uh, it induces uh, variability, and uh, yeah, absolutely. And maybe you can damage also uh, the tissue, because... Uh, yeah, absolutely, so that's, I think, one of the disadvantages, yeah. that you might damage tissue, and just as with the beats setup, you may destroy or, or affect your local uh, physiology. Okay. Of the, of the muscle. And so particularly if you go in with a needle and you puncture in order to deliver an L, uh, a sensor on the endocardial side, yeah, intrinsically you're going to damage the muscle there. Uh, so what we always did, in order, or Patrick did, in order to try to avoid affecting the, the local physiology of that uh, segment that we're studying too much, is to go in obliquely uh, so that you kind of deliver, uh, well, the, the element there like here on the inner side, but you go in from here uh, in an oblique way. So you try to damage myocardium that is not directly at least involved in your measurement area. Well, I pointed here, that's way too far, uh, but you know what I mean. Um, 
Okay, so then the, 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 the principle of doing the measurement was already explained, so it's just a time of flight and we get this type of traces out. So we get the displacement, inter-element displacements as a function of time. And a typical resolution of that system is uh, 15 micrometer according to the manufacturer of our uh, system. So how does then a, a protocol typically look like? So after anesthesia and instrumentation, as I just described, we had uh, different stages. Uh, and at each stage, we would do, uh, first of all, sonomicrometry measurements to get the ground route for our deformation motion. Then in this particular experiment, we did our echo observations, uh, first with uh, 3D systems. So in this particular uh, experiment, we had two systems there. Uh, then we would repeat the crystal measurement. We would go to 2D measurements using all the typical uh, echocardiographic views and then repeat the crystal measurement. So why did we not uh, do crystal measurements and ultrasound measurements at the same time? Well, both are ultrasound-based approaches and one system interferes with the other. So if you do imaging during uh, crystal measurements, you kind of get crappy uh, crystal measurements and vice versa. Uh, the crystals, they show up like uh, twinkling things into the ultrasound image. So that's uh, unfortunate. It would be really nice if we could do it really simultaneously. It would avoid a lot of uncertainty and hassle, but uh, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. So for cardiac, we typically have two and a half megahertz probe in clinical setups. These crystals run at one megahertz, and so they interfere with one another. Um, then, uh, as you see at the top here, we have different uh, stages in our experimental protocol uh, where we have first baseline measurements, so we didn't do anything to the animal. We just opened up the thorax, it's under anesthesia, of course, and we do this uh, whole uh, measurement series. But then we would like to try to modulate the pathophysiology. And so one way of doing that is to infuse uh, esmolol, which is a, a an agent that reduces contractility of the heart, so it starts to contract uh, less vigorously. Uh, motion is slower, deformations are lower. Uh, so we kind of enlarge the motion and deformation range that we uh, well, have in the animal, so therefore we make it easier to see whether we capture that uh, range of uh, uh, variables with our method. Afterwards, we would go to the butamine infusion that has the opposite effect. So it increases contractility, you get more vigorous motion and deformation. And then finally, at the very end, we would induce ischemia, which kind of abolishes uh, local function uh, and uh, has marked effect on local motion and deformation. So we try to widen up the range of motion and deformation values that we are uh, encountering. So I don't know if it shows well. This is Patrick for the ones that uh, haven't seen him yet. Um, here is uh, Stefan, he helped a lot in these experiments. Uh, he's also an anesthesiologist in Ghent, uh, working with Patrick. And I'm Brecht, uh, the student that did most of this work, and uh, myself there scanning, and, uh, and uh, Dr. van den Neuvel also helping out. So as you can already tell, uh, this is like, uh, well, two people actually are not on this slide, the two uh, uh, people that helped in the nursing and the handling of the animal. So it's a very, uh, labor-intensive uh, process. This is one animal. Uh, we need, well, five uh, or, well, actually up to seven highly trained uh, people there. You need a lot of infrastructure to make this happen. Ventilators, x-ray systems, uh, ultrasound systems, uh, the animals themselves. So it, it becomes very labor-intensive and costly. And I'll come back to that uh, later on. Um, now, it might appear that now everything is simple. You just do your ultrasound scanning and uh, you take your images and you have your reference method and uh, off you go, uh, problem solved. Well, unfortunately, as often, it's not that simple. Um, typically, what we do is transthoracic imaging or transesophageal imaging for, of the heart with the ultrasound. But of course, if we kind of uh, opened up the chest like this, where are we going to put the transducer? Uh, so we cannot do a typical transthoracic exam. In any case, in any animal model, it's very difficult to get the typical views that you get in humans because the position of the heart in the thorax is different. Um, so the obvious thing seems to be the heart, the heart is right in front of you. So just put the probe on and you scan and you can get exactly what you want. 
Of course, there is multiple problems there. First of all, that means that the probe is in direct contact with the heart. So the, the most, uh, like in the higher end of the image, you would immediately see the muscle. But there you typically have uh, near field artifacts in the ultrasound image. So you want to be a little bit away actually to avoid this. In addition, if you start pushing on the heart to get uh, contact with the probe, you change uh, local physiology and that could impact your measurements as well. So maybe you don't want that either. Um, and then if you start infusing dobutamine, as I said, the heart starts beating very rigorously. And actually, during contraction, it becomes really stiff. And it's almost as if the heart tries to push you away. And so you try to keep contact, but it pushes you away. And so it can become quite challenging to keep contact during the entire cardiac cycle. So you quite easily get like uh, images that are nice and diastolic, and then they are totally shadowed and systolic or during systole, and then they are good again. So image quality varies a lot during the cycle. So this imaging is actually not that easy. It's not just uh, take the system and scan. So what most people try to do is to use some kind of standoff. Um, and actually, we also uh, and others tried many ways of doing that. At first, we thought maybe we just take a surgical glove, we fill it up with ultrasound gel, and then we have a nice bag of gel to, well, kind of buffer between the probe and the heart. Didn't work that well, uh, very messy as well. Um, in the end, after trying several things, what we found worked best was to take a liver from another animal um, and use that as a standoff. So you had very nice, well, natural uh, tissue uh, in between the probe and the heart that could both be used as like a mechanical buffer between the probe and the heart, but also like an acoustic coupling medium. And so that's uh, an approach that uh, worked very well in the end. So you needed a liver that we typically took from the animal the, from the previous experiment that we had stored in the fridge or the freezer. And then also we needed lots of uh, gel and uh, the microphone. Is the setting for the animal scanning the same as for the human? Uh, or uh, are you using you specific ultrasound machine for, for uh, animals? For, from the system's perspective? Yeah. Yes. No, no, the, the ultrasound system is identical to the one used uh, clinically. Yeah, so there is no modification whatsoever to the ultrasound system as such. It's really the, the, well, the contact of the probe with the subject that is different and that is more challenging in these conditions. But from the ultrasound system perspective, it's identical. And that's actually one of the advantages that you well, work with the exact same ultrasound setup as what you are going to do in a clinical set setting. Okay, so uh, to show some examples here, uh, sonomicrometry, um, we had three crystal pairs here. So you see crystal one, two, one, three, and then three, five, they were numbered. Uh, so where we had the different components uh, of inter-element uh, uh, distances. So these are distance uh, me me uh, measures as a function of the cardiac cycle. Here is our physiological trace of the left ventricular pressures. Um, and although this looks uh, bright and shining, in practice, it can be quite a challenge to get decent traces out. So it sounds like from a measurement concept, very easy. You have two elements, they transmit, receive, uh, and no problem. Well, in practice, it's not that uh, straightforward. And so one of the things you need to do is that in the sonomicrometry system, you kind of uh, imply a gate, a time gate, so that you say, well, anything before this or after this needs, well, cannot be due to a transmission of what I'm interested in. So you kind of limit the sensitivity range of the receive sensor to improve uh, or to avoid uh, noise. But then uh, it's like, uh, playing around with a potentiometer that uh, changes that gate and then it can change during the experiment. And so the more crystal pairs you have, the more potentiometers you have to start uh, regulating. Um, we have experienced that uh, over time, initially this was all analog circuitry for this uh, sonomicrometry. Now, more recently, there is digital uh, boxes available and they help. Uh, but still, it's not uh, always that easy. And so, in the end, if we post-process these traces, we get, uh, st uh, yeah, tra we get strain traces out, like uh, this one. I have some more examples here on the next. 
so where we need to have some timing information, so we need to know where the cardiac cycle starts. So typically for strain, we use antiastole as our reference state, and then we look at the deformation relative to it. So we need, in our experimental setup, also some marker of where antiastole is. And this can be based on ECG, so basically then using the QRS complex. Uh, it can also be based on the left ventricular pressure, so when pressure star starts to build up. Um, but we need these uh, uh, synchronously recorded signals in order to be able to say, well, this is where the cycle starts, and if we look at inter-element uh, distances, this is our reference state. And then we get uh, strain traces out, like uh, here, this is just an example. Um, the reference method here is the sonomicrometry, the solid lines. So where we have the radial strain uh, and then the both circumferential and longitudinal as a negative. The, da the dotted lines are what we obtained with uh, our speckle tracking algorithm. Um, and then this is an example during ischemia where, well, clearly heart rate uh, dropped because the cycle becomes longer. Uh, but also you see blunting of uh, the strain as you would expect in a, in a dysfunctional segment. Okay, um, now even if we get the sonomachromatory system set up uh, correctly and adequately, then we still have a problem because um, we have a spatial uh, registration issue. So during surgery, we say let's implant, we define that uh, prospectively, let's implant the crystals in the basal uh, posterior region. That's uh, typically what is done. Uh, we choose posterior because that sits on the backside of the heart, which is uh, well hidden in the thorax. Um, if we would put them anterior, some people have done it, uh, it's more challenging because that's uh, well directly in contact with air. And so if you then do imaging, you can get all kinds of artifacts there because of the tissue-air interface. Now, you can say, let's put them basal posteriorly, but then during surgery, you have to do that. Uh, as Olivier already said, uh, this is a beating heart. Uh, you cannot just do whatever you want. Uh, you have to be gentle in manipulating uh, the animal. And then posterior side means on the back side. And there you have to start suturing while the heart is beating. So you can imagine that that is not that trivial to do. So there is some uncertainty on where exactly these uh, reference elements end up. And then, even if we do that very carefully, we had a very skilled surgeon uh, that recognizes the relevant anatomical landmarks because, of course, uh, there is no label on the heart that says this is basal posterior. Um, but even then, if we do the imaging, uh, either in 2D with our multiple slices or we take the 3D data set, um, we kind of have uh, typically start to chop up the uh, ventricle into multiple segments. Just one quick sure, question. Yeah. Do you sometimes see the crystals in the echo image? Or? In 3D, typically not. The, s the spatial resolution of the 3D systems, well, it's constantly improving, but uh, when we did these experiments, it was not good enough to clearly see the elements. In 2D, if you have your imaging plane exactly going through the crystal, but remember, the crystals are only one millimeter diameter, so you have to aim well. But if you do that, then you can see them as brighter spots. Yeah. Um, so, but that actually is then part of the problem, because especially in 3D, you don't exactly know where these uh, reference uh, crystals are in your uh, data set. And so you can try to extract strain curves or motion curves from all segments. But then, which curve should you match to the crystal data? Because you're not totally sure where exactly in the data set the crystals were located. And uh, yeah, then uh, you can say, well, it's just the basal posterior segment, but how that is defined? Well, it's strongly dependent on your segmentation. So it's actually not that trivial. And uh, we also struggled with that in how to best do this spatial re registration between the two data sets. And so, in fact, what we used in the paper that has been uh, cited a few times is kind of an optimization approach. We said, okay, basal posterior, that's where we try to insert them. But maybe if we look in a neighboring segment, we actually get better relationship between the crystal data and our ultrasound measurement. And then we use that. Of course, uh, we didn't do that uh, for every recording. Then we decided that per animal. We said, okay, for this animal, apparently, given the imaging conditions and the insertion of the crystals, this segment seems to be the best. 
uh, match, and then we use them. But you kind of use, or we kind of used the sonomicrometry data to determine uh, where we uh, had inserted uh, crystals in the data set. Okay, um, next, more problems. Temporal registration. So the two data sets are recorded by uh, different systems. As I already uh, said, we cannot run these systems uh, in parallel because they interfere. So we typically did uh, crystal measurements before and after imaging, hoping that the animal was sufficiently stable. Uh, we took the average of the pre and post sonomicrometry data as the reference. Uh, and that we compare to our imaging data. But again, if somehow physiology changed, this is typically one of these stages takes, uh, recording all the, the data takes uh, 30 minutes, uh, 45 minutes. Um, if the animal was not completely stable, then uh, yeah, our reference may actually not be adequate for the imaging data. So more uncertainty in the reference. So, um, now, the next couple of slides I'll uh, run through more, more quickly. It's really some studies, and again, it's probably not elaborate. Uh, I do think I covered the most important ones, maybe I missed a few. Uh, but it's uh, data that is in literature that validate motion deformation algorithms using such a setup as I just described. Maybe they did things slightly different than what we did, but in essence, it was a similar experimental setup. So we see, um, in terms of motion estimation, of course, all of you know that uh, there is a lot of activity uh, in 2D speckle tracking, 2D motion estimation. Currently, there are nine commercial solutions. Uh, and if we go and look in literature, there is a couple of them that have been validated in such a, an experimental setup with sonomicrometry. Um, a bit avant la lettre, I think, uh, way back, uh, the, te uh, the team in Yale, uh, the Dr. Papa Demetris, he already did this type of experiments. Actually, way back, he did that also in, in 3D echo. So before anyone else, I think, even thought of doing this, they had already done it. Um, but then uh, we also did these experiments, as I said, uh, with Stian Langeland in 2004, uh, where we validated the software of GE at that time. Uh, Dr. Pirat, uh, it was somewhere in Texas, I think, but I don't remember exactly where. She validated uh, the, the Siemens software in such a setup. And then, well, we also used the same animals, actually, uh, in order to validate our own tracking algorithm. Um, but from the numerous software packages that I uh, refer to, so there is nine commercial ones, as far as I know, only two of them have been really validated using this animal setup. And whether that's good or bad, I'll come back to later on. Um, more recently, the data that we took in the more recent experiments uh, with Brecht, uh, we also used as a benchmark. So we tried to see uh, for both the GE product and what we had developed in-house, how well they performed with respect to uh, the sonomicrometry. Um, more recently, it's becoming, well, it's not uh, taking off as quickly in clinical environment as the 2D technologies, but 3D speckle tracking has also been around, uh, where we can have different approaches to the motion and deformation estimation. I will not go into them. But we see that there is also currently, uh, to my knowledge, um, actually there should be four, I forgot to list one, commercial packages. Uh, there is also one from Tomtech. I think the one from Philips is not yet there, or is it? Or there is none, I don't know. Uh, so as far as I know, I'm sorry if I'm mistaken, but there is three commercially available ones, uh, four uh, if you include uh, TomTech, which is not on the slide, uh, for which I apologize. TomTech is Philips nowadays, that's true. Yeah, so there you go, problem solved. Uh. <laughs> um, so just some examples here. So I, I showed similar things before. Eh? So we have the radial strain here in the experimental animals measured with sonomicrometry uh, and uh, uh, ultrasound, and then uh, longitudinal in blue and circumferential in green, and then both during baseline and ischemic uh, conditions. So this is just uh, one specific example um, where you can also start building bullseye maps um, and then the, the white encoded uh, segment here of the left ventricle is the one where we thought the uh, sonomicrometry uh, crystals were. Uh, 
And so during ischemia, you see here clear blunting of the radial thickening, uh, the circumferential and the longitudinal shortening. So kind of what you hope. There is also artifacts in there, so it's definitely not the perfect uh, data sets, but uh, it gives the idea. So um, if we go through literature in 3D strain, I think there is the study from SEO uh, uh, et al. that was uh, published in 2009. They used a very similar setup than the one I described. They were uh, very courageous and had more crystal pairs. So they had uh, actually multiple sites in the ventricle where they did uh, reference measurements with sonar micrometry. Uh, and that's the findings uh, they obtained. So they then have, uh, because they have uh, elements at multiple uh, levels, they have references at the base, the mid and the apical segments. So they did, they did that more elaborate than uh, what we did in our setup. Um, where they have uh, values for radial, uh, longitudinal and circumferential strain. And so these are the regression coefficients, so they vary from moderate to fair or whatever you want to call them. Ah, well, apparently uh, Brecht, because this is his slide, uh, called it moderate to good correlations. Um, these, well, the slide was from our preliminary experiments uh, where we tried to uh, validate uh, a commercial package, so the one from Siemens. Um, so these are, we only had uh, one site where we had crystals. And so we had, again, our LC strains, uh, the different correlation coefficients for the, the regression analysis. Um, these were the preliminary findings, uh, unfortunately, I didn't make the time or found the time to include in this presentation the final results of the study, but the, those were published uh, uh, well, two years ago now in the Inter in International Journal of Cardiovascular Imaging uh, by Stefan. And then finally, we had our own method. I'll uh, walk through that more quickly. So again, where we found correlations, as one would hope, between the different strain components and the reference measurements. And these uh, are the final results that have been reported uh, in this paper in ultrasound to medicine and biology. Okay, and then the final study I wanted to refer to, just to make sure I didn't leave out people, um, is the team in uh, Portland, uh, Mohamed Ashraf. Uh, he also used similar setup to validate uh, their uh, tracking algorithm. Uh, they only looked at the twist in that particular study, so not uh, the local deformations. Uh, but they also used a registration approach, but a diffeomorphic one. Okay, so in conclusion, I think from all of these studies, uh, I will walk through that fairly quickly, but it was consistent that the radial strain didn't seem to work very well. Uh, longitudinal and circumferential, as you can tell, they seem to behave better, whether that's acceptable or not remains to be discussed. Uh, but the fact that radial is poor in terms of performance is maybe not unexpected. Uh, we need to do a motion gradient over a relatively small region, so the wall is only one centimeter. In the longitudinal or circumferential direction, you can do much more uh, averaging, let's say, in terms of uh, calculating gra gradients. Um, also, the, typically we go from apical views which means that the radial strain is the one orthogonal to the image line, and we know that uh, the resolution there is not uh, the best, uh, particularly if we go more towards, uh, well, deeper down in the image, so more, st more towards the base of the heart. Um, the same, well, this was concluding on 3D, but the same observations were actually made for 2D that uh, radial strain is maybe not the best. And actually, if you talk to clinicians, uh, and there is also clinical studies that show that radial strain is not reproducible, it's not accurate, so it's probably not the way forward uh, currently in a clinical scenario. Maybe just one question. They, they always look here at speckle tracking, but are there like uh, animal studies where you, you try to validate at the same time speckle tracking and Doppler? Um, a good point. I, so with the Doppler-based strains. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, in the series of experiments that we did, we also always acquired the Doppler data sets, but uh, we never analyzed them. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. maybe if uh, there is uh, someone interested in analyzing the data, we still have it. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be a nice paper, actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
because it's another discussion, but I feel that Doppler based is still better, but uh, uh, there is no strong evidence uh, for that, so that could help providing that evidence. Um, so for radial strain, essentially, it might be better to use conservation of volume and say, okay, uh, longitudinal and circumferential, we do measure more properly. So then just assume volume conservation and you can extract radial from it. Or we report, uh, some people have done area strain as a combination of longitudinal and circumferential. That is uh, uh, conservation of volume uh, uh, appropriate. absolutely appropriate or uh, huh. realistic. Uh, I mean, uh, That's a, a discussion I had several times before as well. I personally think not. Uh, people in contrast imaging, they try to understand how much of the volume of the muscle is blood, <laughs> because that's exactly. important to know how many bubbles they can expect there. Because you have perfusion at the same yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. the people most often think of the heart muscle as an elastic material. And then, uh, yeah, if it behaves like rubber, then of course there should be a conservation so of volume. So it has a, some sort of Poisson ratio or something like that. Uh, yeah, I think it's more adequate to see it as a poroelastic medium. So where you yeah. actually have blood during the cycle that enters and that is squeezed out again. So you can, to my opinion, have volume changes. So the volume conservation is not a solution of everything. Yeah? No, 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 yeah. absolutely not. Yeah. But uh, not everyone will agree with what I just said. So yeah. it's, <laughs> it's my opinion. Okay, so because I see we're quarter past 12, so I'll uh, will not uh, go through this because essentially it's a summary of what I said. I think it's more important now to try to move to the next step and I will uh, be briefer than uh, on the motion strain validation. Uh, what if we want to use animal models for validating blood flow? Um, so I said, well, we can look at tracking technology or segmentation. Tracking, we can do look at the myocardium, motion strain. We covered that elaborately now. But what if we want to use tracking for blood flow? And we see in literature that this is what's happening. Uh, of course, color Doppler is uh, very well known. But people try to improve on this technology uh, by going to 2D or 3D particle uh, image velocimetry, so based on echo, so where you need to inject uh, some contrast to get coherence in the image uh, over uh, time. Uh, you can also, if you do high frame rate acquisitions, do speckle tracking. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on the technologies, but you will believe me, maybe you're aware of them, but you will believe me that also for people in that field, it could be of relevance to have some kind of benchmark and reference. So if we then do the same exercise and we say, okay, what do we have available in our animal models as a benchmark, as a reference technique? Then, um, to my knowledge, this list of uh, technologies is much shorter than what I showed before. So we, again, have invasive and non-invasive methods, and uh, very quickly walking through them. Invasively, we have flow meters. Uh, and flow meters, uh, very simple uh, uh, measurement uh, principle. We transmit ultrasound and uh, receive it based on a plane reflector. And then if there is flow in the vessel that is in between uh, the pot, then you will get Doppler shifts. You can uh, detect these uh, accurately. It's a continuous wave, uh, and you get the instantaneous flow estimates uh, because you know the diameter as well because uh, that's determined by your device itself, by the flow meter. So you have them in various sizes, and typically it's used during surgery. You can clip them onto the pulmonary artery quite often, so you get instantaneous flow measurement. Uh, they do that in surgery to, to monitor uh, cardiac output, so to make sure that the uh, cardiac output is not dropping because that's uh, critical uh, uh, in patient care. So this is a reference technique that we could use. Uh, we also use that in our animal setup that I described before. The alternative is to go to phase contrast uh, MRI. Uh, this is a very nice example from the team in Sweden, uh, but I'm sure many of you will have seen similar uh, data sets. So if we now do the same exercise and we say, well, what do we have available in terms of reference techniques? Well, we see that the flow meter is extremely accurate, but yeah, it doesn't give any spatial information on the flow profile. It's just a temporal uh, integrated, well, actually also spatially integrated uh, flow rate that we obtain. So that's typical, uh, well, clearly a big disadvantage. Um, if we consider echo Doppler, which is very well established uh, gold uh, uh, reference method, uh, then 
Well, that is indeed quite accurate, but as you know, Doppler is 1D only and it's angle dependent. And then if we go to MR phase contrast as a non-invasive technique, it indeed enables to get 2D, 3D flow fields out in uh, time even. Um, the contrasts are that we need dedicated sequences, acquisition time is long, we need uh, advanced processing tools to work with these data sets. We could question uh, accuracy and uh, definitely time resolution could also be an issue. Now, if we then make the summary and we say, well, we want to have a validation set up in animals for validating this technology, then it becomes a bit more uh, ambiguous. Um, if we want to go to the more accurate methods, um, actually then we are very limited in the information we get. Um, so we might start questioning whether um, this is the best approach to validate our uh, methodology. Similarly, if we go to the other category of methods in uh, uh, algorithms, so where we go to segmentation, we could try to segment all kinds of structures and we would like to have a reference of what are we supposed to measure uh, in terms of volumes of that chamber or that structure. So what we have there is again a relatively short list uh, where most people as volume reference would use conductance catheters and a conductance catheter is something you can insert into the heart. It has multiple electrodes along the way and the outermost elements will impose a current uh, which will induce an electric field and based on the conductivity or the resistance of the environment you will pick up a different uh, voltage between the more uh, like uh, inner elements. So then um, Based on the, the conductance that you measure, you can try. Oh, you did that, okay. <laughs> it's to wake everyone up. So, uh <laughs> uh, so, but then based on the conductance measured, you can try to get an estimate of the volume. Um, one of the difficulties there is that, uh, obviously, as shown in that picture, you do not only measure the volume from the blood, but also from the surroundings, so the muscle, uh, what they call the parallel conductance. Uh, but then there is uh, uh, approaches using uh, injection of hypertonic uh, saline that kind of try to well make the conductivity of the blood itself almost zero so that you can get the background conductance that is left, the parallel conductance. And so then you can try to get access to the volume. Uh, alternatively, you could again go to sonomicrometry and you could say, well, we can measure the diameter as a function of the cycle, uh, maybe also the long axis dimension uh, by putting the, the sonomicrometers in the right place. And then given geometrical assumptions, we can also get volume changes. And so quite some studies doing pressure volume analysis of uh, the heart have uh, done this this way essentially to avoid the use of conductance catheters because they are quite expensive. Uh, so the, the, just the pressure catheter is much cheaper. Um, finally, well, we have CTMR as a method to look at uh, volumes. And this is just an example from uh, MRI. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, seen that before. So if we go through the same exercise yet again and we look at pros and cons for volumes, uh, we see that the invasive methods uh, are real time, which is good. Um, sonomicrometry is probably cheaper than the conductance, but their uh, disadvantage is that they only measure volumes indirectly. They do not give, give a direct volume estimate. They measure something that is modulated by a volume change, uh, or they need uh, geometric assumptions. On the other hand, if we look at the non-invasive uh, alternatives, MRCT, um, actually they are very accurate or quite accurate. Uh, the only negative thing about it that you could say is maybe that they are costly. But uh, as I said before, animal experiments are also costly. So, well, maybe then uh, adding a bit of cost is not dramatic. So if we now think in validating software for segmentation, then if we are honest and we look at this in an unbiased way, we would have to say, well, the more accurate methodologies that we could use as a reference are non-invasive. And so therefore, there is no strong reason to say that we have to move to an animal. We could as well do that non-invasive imaging in a, in a patient or in a human. So if I 
pop up this diagram again that I used before to defend the use of animals in validating motion and deformation. If we now do the same kind of plot, but in terms of uh, flow uh, field uh, tracking or in terms of volume estimates, so segment uh, segmentation, actually our uh, reliability of our reference is uh, going down. And essentially we have the same level of uh, reference uh, accuracy as in patients. And still, the price we pay is that we do not work in a fully physiological, uh, human physiological environment, not the same imaging conditions, so we do pay a price in terms of the realism of the data set. So, is it still worthwhile to go to an animal in this case? Well, um, very briefly, if we work with animals, of course we don't have to do that lightly. And people that are trained in animal research, they are always lectured about the principle of the three R's. I don't know if you have ever uh, encountered them. But essentially they were proposed uh, in the late 50s uh, by two researchers. And they said, well, if we work with animals, of course we have to think of the ethics about that. And whenever possible, we should replace animals with non-sentient uh, alternatives. We should reduce the number of animals that we use and we should refine the experiments uh, to cause uh, the minimum amount of pain and stress in the animals. So that's the principle of the three R's. Um, I'm see, I see I'm, well, maybe not running out of time, but running towards the end, so I'll go through this a bit more quickly. I don't have too much left. Um, so how could we replace the use of animals? Well, we could move in vitro, but that's maybe more for cell biology and so on, uh, molecular biology. Uh, we could use uh, different animals that are maybe ethically uh, less difficult to work with. Um, or we could uh, think of alternatives like simulations, and so that's perfectly fitting to what you had uh, uh, on Monday. Additional, next to the ethics, additional motives to move away and to replace animals with uh, something else could be also scientific, uh, next to ethics. So scientifically, maybe if we have alternatives, mock models or synthetic uh, setups, maybe we can get to results faster. Uh, maybe we actually have more freedom in what we manipulate than in a ma an animal setting. Um, Actually, there might be less mistakes because there will be less inter-individual uh, variability because one animal is not the same as the other animal. Also, economically, there could be good reasons uh, because lab, lab experiments uh, are expensive. Uh, quite often, these experiments are very time-consuming, so also in terms of personal cost, it can be a bottleneck. Um, and well, if you do not have to work with animals, it's also typically more accepted uh, by the public and maybe by uh, funding agencies. So if you uh, write a grant and you say, I will do animal experiments, it, well, you ha you'll have to defend that uh, more and more and really give good reasons why you <coughs> need animals. So next to the ethics, there could be other reasons to replace animals for, uh, for this. Second is reduction, so well, of course you would like to do, if you do animals, you would like to do it with as few animals as possible. Um, that could be done by designing the experiment in a better way, to do more clever statistics maybe, uh, by using pilot studies and not engage in large series before you have kind of proof of concept data. To share animals with uh, co-workers, maybe they are also interested in something that could match your own experiment so that you piggyback on one, uh, one another's uh, experiments and expertise. Again, the mathematical modeling could help in reducing. Um, and, well, of course, if we start sharing data, so maybe if I say, well, the echo data I took in, uh, excuse me, in our experimental animals, I'll make that available to you, then maybe there is no need for you to do also a series of animals. And then finally, refinement, what is this about? Well, it's really to, if we decide that animals are unavoidable uh, to move our research forward, then uh, at least we can make sure that the animals are as comfortable as possible. And that's all about refinement. So we try to give them a comfortable uh, habitat. 
uh, we train or we feed them well, we, we, we treat them as, uh, respectfully. So um, that's the summary. Actually, I got these slides from uh, the head of our uh, animalium. Uh, because uh, that's the summary of what we need to think of, uh, these three R's, when we want to engage in animal experiments. And in fact, she added a four R, which is responsibility. So it's each of us, uh, our personal responsibility to really consider whether the animal experiment is really required, and then if it is required to apply these three R's. So, in fact, it's four hours. We have to take responsibility and not just uh, look at the others. So, after th thinking about these ethical considerations, or going through these ethical considerations, if I then pop up this slide again, and I say, well, in our experimental animal setup, if we want to go uh, for flow and volume validation, our reference is actually as good as in humans, uh, then probably we have to say, well, for this type of validation or for validating this type of software, we cannot justify animal work. Uh, we simply don't have good reasons and we better directly move to patients. Um, I showed this before and I said, well, but one advantage is that we can modulate in an animal the pathophysiology. And so maybe this helps us in the validation process uh, and that's maybe not possible in uh, patients, uh, especially if you want to experimentally induce ischemia, you cannot do that uh, in patients, I fully agree. So that could be an exception maybe to the rule that I just uh, kind of postulated. Um, but still, I think if we are creative and we understand clinical scenarios and workflows, that also in that setting, quite often we are able to modu modulate uh, pathophysiology in an ethically acceptable way, not affecting patient outcome or uh, health. Um, maybe not always possible, but I think in quite some cases it is possible. It just takes more creativity and maybe it's logistically more difficult, but it can be avoided to some extent. So the bottom line is that I wanted to really say that uh, despite of all the animal work I did myself and that I uh, introduced to you, that I think we really have to think twice or maybe three times before engaging. And so for all of the reasons I mentioned, ethics, costs, uh, but also uh, in the end we still have to make a translation from the experimental animal where then maybe our software showed to work well to the clinical scenario. And that step is maybe not always that easy. Um, image quality is different, geometry differs, uh, physiology differs, there is other uh, confounding factors that change. So now, if I look back at uh, my own uh, trajectory in validating strain, uh, where we engaged in animal experiments uh, several times, so I see that, I popped up this slide again, I see that indeed we initially developed and uh, tested our methods in synthetic data and mock models. Then, which seemed quite natural, we moved to the next step in experimental animals, where we validated against solar micrometry. Um, and I hope that it, I also made it clear that solar micrometry in itself can be used as a reference, but uh, that it's not straightforward, that it has defin definitely challenges. So maybe it should not be used for benchmarking uh, or to improve the algorithms. Uh, and then finally we started testing and uh, applying in patients. So looking back, thinking of all these uh, issues, I think maybe it's better to skip this step and to say, well, let's technically develop and validate in uh, synthetic data and mock models. If we are confident there that, well, it seems to be working, Maybe we simply skip the animal step and we directly move to patients. And so, personally, I think, uh, retrospectively, looking back, maybe we should not uh, have gone through these experiments. Killing the animal. Sorry? You are killing the animal. Yeah, yeah, it's terminal, it's terminal experiments. So you, we use ischemia at the very end, and uh, even if nothing would have affected uh, the animals and they could continue to live a healthy life by ethics that's not allowed. 
so by the ethical committee board. So meaning in a figurative way that with this conclusion that you skip the animal uh, validation, it's like killing the animal validation. Ah, that's what you mean. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought killing the animals. No, no, killing uh, the whole process. Uh, yes, so I would uh, try to defend that uh, position, yeah, so that uh, maybe we do not have to engage if it is for the mere purpose of validating software. I mean, this was a very interesting debate, but what I wanted to, to say also, we had, uh, uh, I mean, you mentioned, uh, by the way, in fact, uh, this question of uh, um, perfusion and actually the fact that uh, uh, volume conservation is not a must or things like that. Yeah, yeah. And er uh, earlier also, uh, we um, heard a very interesting talk about, uh, you know, details of, uh, uh, of small animals, huh? Uh, the, 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 in fact, uh, seeing this at, uh, at a very tiny level, also very well resolved in time. I mean, it was, we had a very interesting uh, mm -hmm. uh, presentation I, uh, uh, a while ago uh, in, in this uh, workshop. So uh, my, my question is, uh, can we, if we, we, we uh, I mean, um, uh, animal experimentation may be useful if, if not for big animals, actually more ethical animals. We can actually kind of uh, have a push on understanding basic philosophy, physiology, and basic things that could help uh, the, uh, the uh, how do you say, uh, the in silico model uh, to get nearer and nearer to realism. I mean, uh, is that yeah. something, yeah. Uh, I mean... Uh, no, but with that I would fully agree. Eh? So the statement I try to make, and I'll have it on the next slide, which is my last and conclusion slide. So we're okay. almost there. Okay. Uh, but my conclusion or statement would be that I would think justifying the use of animals merely to look at whether software works or not is uh, not a good thing. So to do animal experiments, to just look at software validation. If but you want to understand pathophysiology, it's a whole different basic thing. Basic physiology eh? and basic, uh, how do you say, biology of uh, the tissue they are looking at and the blood flow and everything yeah. actually uh, get, get to the basics, uh, the basic fundamentals that That's could help else. actually something uh, much more uh, uh, yeah. sophisticated and capable of uh, getting nearer to realism uh, in, uh, in, yeah, yeah. in silico models. But then, then I think the use is justified. But not if you just want to s yep. say, well, does my strain tracking work? And, and it's not the same. It may not be even the same kind of animals we're looking at because no, you can true. get then the fundamental might, aspect yeah, yeah. actually are present at different scales. Yeah, huh? yeah. But then the main question is pathophysiology. It's not does my software work? Yeah. And then I think that's a whole different story. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Uh, in fact, if we look at uh, some of the speckle tracking data from the Trondheim team, they, after doing these mock models and uh, uh, synthetic uh, developments and testing, they immediately went to an in vivo study where they compared in a patient setting against uh, MR tagging. Um, and so maybe, uh, actually that was not a bad idea. So now I said retrospectively, maybe it's wise to skip the step of uh, experimental validation. Uh, actually, that's what they had done at the time, and uh, maybe that was uh, actually very wise. So, to conclude, um, experimental animals might be used to validate software to assess motion strain. I put might, uh, maybe it's not necessary, because it seems uh, ethically uh, at least not justifiable to do the same for merely validating, so with the only intent to validate software tools to assess morphology and blood flow. Um, again, if there is uh, other reasons to set up the experiments, like uh, if we want to look at uh, pathophysiology, I think it's another uh, debate. And so ideally, if we say we need to, or we want to engage in experimental animals, the, in our experimental protocol, there should be, I think, a pathophysiological component to it. So where we really not only validate the software, but at the same time, try to understand better the pathophysiology. And then I think it's more justified. Alternatively, uh, maybe your colleagues uh, are looking into pathophysiology and do animals. So then we could also say, well, okay, you, you're going to work with these animals in any case. Maybe I can piggyback on your experiments and then do some of my validation as well. But again, doing only animals 
with the uh, only intent to validate the software, I think, becomes ethically difficult. And this is particularly so because if I look back, and there uh, it might become very much an opinion, but if I look back uh, at the experimental animal work, I think it's fair to say that the impact of those studies on the true development and improvement of the tools has been extremely limited. So I think whatever we would have in terms of improvements and development of the software aspect, we could also test in uh, mock models and synthetic data and ultimately then go immediately to patients. But the step of animals there, I think, is kind of incremental and we kind of uh, just acknowledge what we already knew from the other settings, um, maybe in a more spectacular way, but I don't think it has big impact on the software development as, as such. Um, okay, so I hope I could convince you that uh, if you want to work with animals, you have to think carefully about it, and uh, you really have to consider what such an experiment uh, could bring or enable on top of human studies. And I think if you are creative, you can do testing uh, of quite a lot of things in the human setting. And so in the end, if you work with animals or you decide it is required, use the four R's. Okay, that's all, thank you. So thanks a lot, it was a very fascinating talk for me. It's funny because I was going to ask you about the flow because I thought you would only speak about deformation. Ah, ah, okay. And then you did uh, this very uh, in-depth discussion. So it was... Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, one quick question I think you partially answered. How difficult would it be to convince people or institutions or uh, eth not ethics approvals, but like uh, people who need to put a norm on... Uh, to validate a certification on software that they are sometimes reluctant to synthetic data and they ask for these animal models. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. If, uh, of course, le regulatory offices uh, say, well, we need to see it works in animals, otherwise you cannot go to market. Uh, uh, yeah, then, well, from a commercial perspective, it's unavoidable. Uh, but I would think we then have to try to argue towards the regulatory offices that uh, maybe there is no strong need. And so help them, or try to convince them of what I tried to say here. Might be hard, but... Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, also so a comment I wanted to make for several talks in the, in the winter school is that we, we usually I present the validation framework with the animal, the, in the synthetic, and the, and the patient uh, as things that have like strict boundaries. But what I think is that, uh, well, what was the initial idea of Olivier and Martino when they started to mix a synthetic motion field in a true image, uh, this idea can be extended also in the sense that uh, you could take uh, a phantom. We, we know, like, we have seen some examples in in the hands-on sessions, uh, some geometries of the phantoms get really accurate and have very nice motion. What's mm. not so nice is sometimes the everything around <laughs> the background. But that can also be taken from, from real patients. So I think that this concept yeah. of uh, mixing reality and models, being in vitro uh, or animal, is also something that could be done, um, let's say, to get uh, let, then it's not, it's not really any more synthetic data. I don't know how we will need to call it, but <laughs> part yeah, of the data will be actually a, a real acquisition. And, and I think I started off with, well, saying the, or uh, pointing out the difference between a technical verification as defined by FDA uh, or regulatory offices and uh, more clinical validation. Ultimately, what is important is clinical validation. Um, but it seems plausible that uh, it cannot be validated clinically if it doesn't work technically, so if the verification process failed. But ultimately, this uh, verification process is kind of uh, not that critical, I would say. If it can help in patient uh, treatment, that, that's what matters. Okay, yeah. One last question. Thank you.
Uh, what if we just do um, a kind of uh, diagnostic imaging that uh, will not do any uh, invasive uh, intervention to the animal, and we do not need to to kill the animals? So, is it still um, having yeah, so then, many constraints? But then, why not do it in healthy volunteers? Why do you need the animal to do interventions? Um, but then it should be pharmacological interventions, I would say, because you, want, you don't want to intervene uh, surgically in the animal. So also in volunteers, you could ask them to exercise to increase contractility. Mm -hmm. uh, you could ask them to do a hand grip, uh, so that's also exercise. You could uh, maybe give them a product that is not harmful to them, uh, which would lower uh, output for a short while. Uh, so I think Definitely you don't have the liberty uh, to do with volunteers or patients that you would have in animals. But again, the added value might be limited to really then consider an animal. And if you say we don't do surgery, then why not just go to humans? Uh, there you don't need to do surgery either. And then you just uh, do the non-invasive im imaging. And the ethical approval will be as difficult as the animal uh, to the human, to the healthy volunteers? <laughs> It really depends on the, on the protocol, eh? uh, but uh, if it's nicely set up, I would think you can equally well get ethical uh, committee approval for a human study than for, for the animal study. But it's you do not need to have uh, only as you can use also No, no, also patients. Uh, there, there patients yeah. and relate this to, uh, to measurements. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And so uh, I think I put that somewhere on the slide, but I forgot to mention, uh, of course, if you go to patients, there is a lot of pathophysiological variation. The only uh, the, uh, uh, flip side is that it's then typically cross-sectional. So it's much more difficult to get longitudinal pathophysiological changes in a controlled manner. Uh, but if you are willing to go cross-sectional, then there is no issue. You can take an ischemic group and a normal group. Uh, or, uh, so there is a lot of uh, variation uh, amongst the patients. So why not use that? Okay, I think it's uh, time for lunch. <laughs> and well, so let's thank again the speaker.